Good morning, everybody. Uh, and happy Father's Day to all of you. Even to the ladies, I want you to have a happy day as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I said that uh, many years ago when, when Peggy and Paul Schumacher were coming through the door, this was many years because she was married to Ted for six years, I think, or something like that after Paul passed. But anyway, they came in on a Father's Day, and, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, on a Mother's Day. They came in on Mother's Day. Peggy was first, and I welcomed her with Happy Mother's Day. Paul was right behind her, and I said, Happy Mother's Day to you too, Paul. And he went, I'm not a mother. I said, I, 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 I understand, Paul, but, but I still want you to have a happy day today. Happy, happy Mother's Day to you. It's like saying Merry Christmas, you know. So, anyway, uh, today we're uh, still studying the Psalms of David. And today the title of our lesson is God is Good. I'll bet you thought all this time that God is love. Well, let me tell you that there's not much difference between good, being good, and, and, and being lovely, or loving, as the case may be. Just not much difference between that. Anyway, the uh, lesson today is Psalm number 34. Um, and there are uh, uh, there are many verses, small verses, short verses, that are verses that you've heard. Uh, if you've been in church any time at all, you've heard lots of these verses. Uh, and and some of them, uh, I probably won't have time to talk about uh, because there is so much material in Psalm 34. But I'm going to make it even worse from a timing standpoint because I want to start somewhere else. Put, put your, uh, your marker uh, in your Bible at Psalm 34 uh, because, I, like I say, I want to start somewhere else. But uh, if you have a King James Version like mine or similar to it, between the place in the Bible where it says Psalm 34 and verse number 1, there is a little explanation of what this psalm is about and when it happened. Now, if you don't have a King James Version like mine or similar to it that has that, I will read that to you. It says that Psalm 34 is a psalm of David when he changed his behavior before Ahimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. So that gives us some clue to the timing of when um, David wrote this psalm. Uh, now let, let me remind you just in general history a little bit that um, uh, David was the second king of Israel. Um, Saul was the first. And there wasn't a smooth transition. I mean, if, if you think we've had a, a poor transition in our country from the election of 2016 until now, we're the opposing side just won't accept the fellow that got elected to be president. Uh, if you think well, we have had bad, uh, this transition was uh, multiple times. You know, I, I don't have any way to say whether well, it was a hundred times worse or a thousand times worse or something like that. But uh, in, in this case, when uh, Saul realized he was going to be replaced 
he got mad. And he got mad in a big way. And he still uh, was the commander in chief. And he still was in charge of the army. And, and he did uh, a lot of things to our uh, younger friend David that, uh, that, that were just unseemly. Just should not have, uh, have occurred. So I want to go through a little of that history before we get to actually reading this psalm today. Uh, and then it'll make the this, this psalm more meaningful to realize the circumstances in which it occurred. So I would like you to turn with me to 1 Samuel. Find 1 Samuel. It will be to the left of Psalms, about halfway, roughly halfway to... Uh, before 2 Samuel. Yeah, it's, it's right before 2 Samuel. But it's the, uh, it's the uh, I think, the 10th book in the Bible, 1 Samuel is. Uh, looky, looky here, I got it. I got it on the board over here. Uh, we can see down from Genesis to 1 Samuel. Now I'm going to cover some of this stuff up. Um, uh, I want to show you the amount or the kind of what, what the Bible was like when... Uh, when David was king. Now, actually, uh, probably Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, probably were not written yet when, uh, when David was king. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave them open here, especially since we're reading out of 1 Samuel today. Ruth was written more than likely and they don't know for sure, but more than likely 500 years later. Uh, and it was a, a historical book written back about uh, the things that happened to her. Judges was probably written by Samuel and, uh, and probably written during this same time because many of the, the accounts of of judges uh, started out with when there was no king in Israel. And so in, in this writing itself, it indicates that it, whoever the writer was knew that later there were kings after judges, okay? What we do know is that these first five books of Moses and the book of Joshua was written the reason I, uh, I think that that's important to us in, in reviewing uh, David's writing of Psalm 34 today uh, is that I want you to know that he didn't have a Bible like you and I have. He didn't, he didn't have the ability to see everything that this purple thing is covered up and that this map is covered up, okay? And speaking of the map, let me tell you, and I'll remind you from months ago when I used to say the top ten and bottom two. Okay? Talking about the twelve tribes of Israel. This green stuff is the top ten. And the purple stuff is the bottom two. Okay? So Jerusalem is is down here in the bottom stuff. It's down here in Judah. Uh, which uh, somewhere along the line the pronunciation got changed to Judea but if you hear Judea it's interchangeable with Judah it means it means that same same area and the Benjamites lived in here as well so there were two tribes of, of, uh, of Abraham um, um, Judah was one son, and he got his share of territory when the children of Israel came uh, across the Jordan River into the Promised Land, and, and Benjamin was another son, and he got his share, uh, or his descendants did. 
all of these were descendants because it was uh, 450 years later, roughly 430 years or something like that. I don't remember exactly, but anyway, uh, 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 Jerusalem uh, apparently existed at the time they came over, and somehow that became God's favorite place in all of the world. And, uh, and whether it is still today or not, I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the children of Israel still seem to be, the Jews still seem to be um, claiming uh, you know, the, uh, the gifts of the Almighty, but they, they rejected him. They rejected his son. They killed his son. And, and so whether or not his grace extends to them today in the way that we typically perceive it or have it taught to us by Christendom out there, uh, that uh, that, that we get to uh, uh, be very observant of the Jewish people. I, I don't know whether that still applies to, uh, to their promises or not. Uh, I have not been able to convince myself one way or another in all of the study that I've ever done that there's, that there's any uh, a special affinity that God has for the Jewish people and Jerusalem than he has for the Christian people in Spring, Texas and anywhere else that I've ever that I've ever been and there's other places that I have been but anyway here's Jerusalem but um, but just down the road one dot Here's Bethlehem, okay? Bethlehem. And this, uh, see, there's a difference of opinion whether the city of David, known as, uh, when, 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 when that phrase is used, whether it's talking about Bethlehem or whether it's talking about Jerusalem. Because when he was king, part of the time, he lived in Jerusalem. And that's where he built his palace and, and so forth. Anyway, there's a lot to do with that, but let's get to the selection. I want to get to the reading history, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not going to stop and comment. I'm just going to read 1 Samuel chapter 16. Find 1 Samuel chapter 16. And I'm going to read roughly half of that, just so that you see the selection of um, of David as king, and he was still just a young man. He was still just I, you know I don't know his age, uh, but he was still his daddy's uh, sheepkeeper, his daddy's shepherd. Okay. First uh, Samuel chapter sixteen verse one, and the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul? seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel. Fill thine horn with oil and go. I will send thee to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. And, and now I'm stopping, because you see there's the clue we have that he's going to Bethlehem. Okay. Okay. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hear it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take an heifer with thee and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice. And I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that, which the Lord spake, and he came to Bethlehem. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Yeah, peaceably. I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. 
sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and he called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen thee, or has not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Art here all thy children? And he said, Well, there remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent, and he brought him in. And notice here's, here's a, a description of, uh, of the young uh, man, David. Now he was ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, Samuel, anoint this one, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. He left town. I want to read one more verse, 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled Saul. I think this is your answer, John. It's just what you read here. We were wondering whether or not Jerusalem was a city. How long will you mourn for someone he's rejected? He's rejected Israel, he just, or he rejected Jerusalem, he destroyed it. And uh, furthermore, says the Lord, look upon the heart. What's the heart of that city? It's almost like it, that, that, what you just read there kind of answers that question. There's more Muslims, I think, in, in Jerusalem today than, than there are Jews. And uh, and, uh, and certainly more Muslims than there are Christians. Uh, the, the political struggle over Jerusalem right now is how to divide it up. And the Jews, of course, uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying, ah, we're not giving up any of Jerusalem. And the Muslims are saying, oh yeah, we're going to get the eastern half of it, that, that's, gonna, that's our capital. And that's where Mount Moriah is, that's where their, uh, excuse me? Can you show us Mount Moriah on the map? Well, you can see it really, but it's, it's, yeah, it's in Jerusalem. Uh, that's the Temple Mount. That's, uh, that's where the Dome of the Rock is. You, you, all the pictures you see with that, control that now. With, that, with that shiny go. Yeah, the Muslims are in control of that mountain. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't let just anybody go up there. 
uh, you got to be special. Like last week, I said to get in the Mormon temple over here, or, uh, Cypress Wood and Chamber Force Drive, it's restricted. You got to be special to get in. You get in there. But anyway, no it one, seems like the Christians are mourning still for that. Oh yeah, we were. Instead that, that, of not instead just the Christians, of, uh, not just the Christians. The gods rejected. Not just the Christians, the Jews. The Jews uh, too. Yeah. Jews too. All right. There's far more Christians right. than there are Jews, though. So turn to uh, <laughs> turn turn a few pages to chapter twenty one in First Samuel. Can I ask a question? Sure. On, on verse fourteen, where it says, "And an evil spirit from the Lord." Yeah. Now, I don't understand that. How can an evil spirit come from the Lord? Well, he, he created everything. Well, I know, but I, I feel like, you know, when we're trying to witness to people, we say, God is all good. Nothing bad comes from him. I think if you read into that, though, if you read further on into that, uh -huh. it he, the Lord sends a spirit to distress him, which in turn gets David brought to him, okay? Because mm -hmm. they, because he uh, supposedly was supposed to be his heart bearer, um, and that's how David was taken out of the field and brought to Saul well, to comfort him. Well, uh, while he tried the, to sleep, I think that's part of it. Because I thought the same thing too. Because it's like, well, why would God send a distressing no, spirit? On let's, listen, the trouble is. Christendom out there. Christendom out there. Christendom out there teaches us that uh, nothing evil comes from God. They don't read the Word. They just repeat what they've heard other people say that they have respect for or that they were taught in seminary or Bible school or whatever you want to call it. But this is not the only place that indicates that that God sent evil on people or or he allowed evil to come upon people. Yeah, and James but, it does say though that every good thing comes from Father of Light. But it doesn't say that not all evil. Right. Right. This, is, this is, do not be, you're never tempted, saying you're tempted of God. It's just, that's just, it's a different context. But some people say that the, the evil spirit also is just the idiom for, like, you know, distress. You know, but, but it seems to me it's pretty clear that it's evil it, It's pretty clear, uh, and it's in more than one uh, it's, translation. It's not something just, I was coming up with the other day, too, where it says that we shall judge angels. But it doesn't say ever that angels are always good. Because you can have angels that are evil. Well, you have angels of light and you have angels of dark. Right. Mm -hmm. You have to judge them. Uh, and, uh, the good part is we have twice as many angels of light as we do angels of dark. But, but the point here is, Miss Betty, that, that the things that, that in general out there in Christendom is, is, is what you expressed. But you, how can we argue with what the Word of God says? I, I can't. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to continue to believe that God sent that evil spirit to Saul. Well, did God create um, the angels that were so did he then create well, God, sin? Yeah, well, well, God created. See, that's one of the things that atheists try to say that is a is, a, is something that's wrong. That God created Satan, so therefore God is evil. You know, but that isn't. God gave Satan and the angels of dark free will. That's a lot of things people. So well, another thing I was thinking about just recently is can angels still fall now? There's nothing in the Bible that says they couldn't. There could be angels that are still falling. You know, I mean, who knows? Yeah. Just like there's people, you have free will. You have the choice of choosing evil or good. Yeah. Obviously, Satan chose evil. And, and for a while in your life, you can choose good 
And then you can change your mind and go choose evil. Well, Saul. And Saul's a prime example. Okay. Right? So, Saul is. So the opposite is true too, Goody, which is that you can do evil for a while in your life and then choose to do good. So the freedom of choice just waffles back and forth in there. But here's a time in history, I'm, I'm trying to tell you about David writing Psalm 34 that we're going to get to in a minute. After we, it, this, this will make Psalm 34 more meaningful to you, I think. Because here's a, an innocent little kid that grew up tending sheep fighting bears and lions with his bare hands and God uh, causing him to prevail in, in those battles. And it built his confidence in God to the point that he was willing to go up against a nine and a half foot tall guy that was covered in armor that only had one little spot right here that was, was left uh, vulnerable. And, and David had the courage with no armor at all to go out against this Philistian warrior. Here's Philistia over here on the map, okay? Uh, which is important because of what I'm going to read next because in uh, when, when, when that, that last verse, when this evil spirit came upon Saul, he began to chase David. He was going to kill David to keep David from being king in order for Saul to keep his kingship. Um, I'm in um, 1 Samuel chapter 21 right now. Uh, uh, and, and I want to start at verse 10, if you've got that. Okay. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul. And he went to Achish, the king of Gath. Okay. I was pointing that out there just a minute ago. He left Judah and went over here. Gath is just in the edge of Philistia. So he went into enemy territory to seek refuge from Saul who was chasing him. Okay? And it says the servants, verse 11, the servants of Achish said unto him, said unto Achish, is not this David, the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands? And David, his ten thousand? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. So, notice David was afraid of Saul and he ran to Gath only to be afraid of the king of that place. Okay? So here's what he did when he felt himself in danger. And this is the reference that I read to you just above the chapter of verse 34 out of my Bible, whether it was in your Bible or not. It, it made reference to, to this portion. It says he changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. So he was acting as crazy as he could act. So then said Achish, verse 14, unto his servants, Lo, Ye see, the man is mad. Wherefore then have ye brought him to me? 
Have I need of madmen that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? He didn't, he didn't really know who this fellow was. This fellow was scared and slobbering into his beard and says scrabbled on the gates or the doors there. Uh, apparently he had some chalk or something or other and he was just making, I, I, you know, week today we call that graffiti. My father says it was scratch. Yeah, okay. Same thing. Uh, or something similar anyway. Uh, but we basically, it's, nowadays we perfected graffiti. We don't scratch anymore with our uh, our hands or our fingers, but we use spray paint to, 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 do, to do the same thing. Okay, so let's go back to Psalm number 34, which is the lesson today. Yeah, when you get to 34, I have a question for you. Well, I am at 34. Okay, you are? Yeah. Is your, in, the, in that title, does it say Ahimelech? You said Ahimelech. Mine says Ahimelech. Oh, well, if I said Ahimelech, then I, I mis, misstated it. You just say Ahimelech? Yeah, it does say Ahimelech. Because yeah. I was studying that, and that seems to be like, well, they possibly think that's a title, because it really means like King Akish. Well, it's, yeah, it really does mean that, but it's, uh, it's, uh, my understanding is it's, it's, it's priest-like. In other words, that particular person is the person they worship or the person they go to for worship or the person who leads worship. But he's referring uh, to King Achish. Yeah, over here in King, over here in Gath. Right. Okay. okay. We're talking about... Because uh, earlier in Samuel, First Samuel there, it talks about Ahimelech. Is someone else? Yeah, and I'm, if I said Ahimelech uh, before, I just misstated because right. mine, so sure mine does say mine does say Abimelech okay. in it. Uh, but anyway, we're talking about a difference in culture here. Uh, Philistia, the, the Philistines are the, the, the were the were the arch rival enemy of the Judeans uh, forever. And, and, and ever and ever and ever. Now, in current day, 2000, 2019, since 1968, I think it was, 1968, Israel captured this. And this is now part of Israel, but it's referred to as the Gaza Strip. Okay? Uh, and it's still fenced off from Israel uh, proper but it, but it's but it's part of Israel. Now the, it's it's Muslim dominated, and and, and er, er, almost every day there are rockets that are sent. Uh, just they just shoot stuff up in the air, uh, hoping that it'll come down and do some damage over there against their enemies. Uh, they're not very sophisticated, but still. This area, the Gaza Strip, here's, here's Gaza down here. It's the name of a town. It's, the, I guess, the capital. I don't know for sure. Um, but, but anyway, this particular strip of land is within the border of Israel, but is like the other side of the tracks, okay? Only the tracks, in this case, is a, is a, a fence. Um, uh, there's a even a demilitarized zone. There's two fences, that are, uh, 200 feet apart, or something like that. So that there's a couple hundred feet in there where um, the Israelis, uh, if somebody climbs that first fence and heads their way, they, get, they shoot them. You know. Those are landmines. Yeah, yeah, they got they got all kinds of weapons weaponry in there okay so here we are uh, let me read this again at the beginning uh, before verse one it says this is a psalm of david when he changed his behavior 
Okay, now that's what I read to you just a minute ago in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. He changed his behavior uh, when he realized he was in trouble. Okay? And it says that uh, that, that fellow drove him away and David departed. And so it was it was roughly at that time that he read, I'm sorry, that he wrote these things that we're going to read today. 22 uh, verses. Let me say to you uh, that, that in, I think in the literature, in your book, I think it tells you that this was uh, an acoustic poem. And what that means is that, that uh, he took the alphabet and acrostic. acrostic uh, I'm sorry, sh I let my R out. Uh, the acrostic of uh, starting at the top of the alphabet and going to the bottom of the alphabet, except he apparently skipped one uh, and and used one twice. Uh, and I don't know which which one is which. In English, it doesn't come through that way. But what he did was he started each verse with with each of those uh, those um, uh, letters in the in the Hebrew alphabet. Starting out, verse one: I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. One of the way he delivered him from the fear of Achish was uh, something inspired him to act crazy. And, and he did. Verse 5. They looked unto him, that's God, and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. The poor man, or this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Oh, fear the Lord ye his saints for there is no want to them that fear him uh, uh, fearing him doesn't mean being afraid of him okay fearing him means being reverent in his presence in his house uh, I think it, my, my personal opinion is it goes f further than just being reverent. It means uh, dressing appropriately in his presence. Let me tell you that you can go back into Leviticus, uh, and, I, and I'm not going there today, so don't worry. You know, you're safe. You're safe. But uh, it, it, um, uh, indicates there that he that God was very particular about the clothes that people wore, especially the priests, especially the ministers. Uh, I mean, he, in, in, he describes in detail the clothing for them to wear. And we have, we have the general idea that uh, that God hasn't changed his uh, his requirements for people uh, today are the same as his requirements for people back then. 
we just struggle with finding what that really is and how that fits into to our being. I, I, yeah, I could say more about that, but I want to finish reading the the uh, the chapter, verse ten. I'm a, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is he that desireth life and loveth many days that he may see good? And boy, here's a good one. Keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking God. Ooh. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. The righteous cry and the Lord heareth and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. That's probably the most famous verse in this, this whole chapter. I mean, it, it gets, it gets uh, spoken, not necessarily cited as coming from Psalm 34, um, verse 19. But it gets spoken in uh, in sermonary comments all the time. You hear it. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones; not one of them is broken. Yeah, you know, I, I I'll stop here for I don't, I don't even know for 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 why, but uh, when I was a kid growing up in in church, this verse uh, there was a guy in a, in a automobile accident in my church, and. I was I was maybe I don't know 12, 13 years old, uh, and this fellow was a prominent guy in our church in an automobile accident, and and had some broken bones, and he took this verse and said, "I must I must not be God's child." I think that's sad. Now, then, I, you know, okay, you know, I mean, I, I'm just a kid. Didn't matter, didn't bother me. I mean, it was some other guy. You know, bad stuff always happens to the other guy until it happens to you. Okay, but anyway, that's not what he's talking about here. He keepeth all his bones; not one of them is broken. That doesn't mean that if you had a broken arm, that God doesn't love you. That if you've had a broken leg, that, that you can't go to heaven. You, you can go to heaven with, with no legs. Uh, there, there are uh, people who have, who have lost both both legs in war or 
auto accidents or whatever. I had to have them amputated. But their soul is not in their leg. It's not where their bone is is broken. Many people think that's a prophecy of Jesus on the cross. Too. Yeah, they do. And, and they... Uh, uh, I don't... I don't uh, ex accept that, uh, but I could be wrong. Uh, I don't know. There are several places in the scripture where God specifically talks about uh, not breaking bones. And, and uh, most of the time it has to do with, with preparing an animal for sacrifice. So you're killing an animal. You're going to slit his throat or whatever it is. Uh, to let him bleed to death, to sacrifice that animal to God and to sacrifice that animal's blood. Uh, he, he, and, and God says, don't break any of his bones. You just, you just slit his throat and let him die or you cut his head off or whatever. The, you know, that'd, that'd be quicker than, than letting him just bleed out. But, uh, Either way, I mean, even if he's bleeding out, pretty soon he's going to pass out because there's no blood uh, going going to his brain. I think there's also but, many examples too. You were talking about having you know good people that were killed by broken bones. Stephen would be one. He was stoned to death. Yeah. I'm sure he had broken bones. I'm sure Paul had broken bones of all the beatings he went through. Uh, yeah, there's, there's he was stoned and left for dead. Yeah. So I'm sure when you, when you get stoned, you're, you're going to have some broken bones, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, having never been stoned, I, I don't know <laughs> the answer to that. But but the, the point the point is, uh, I'm I'm telling. Yeah, I've never been stoned. <laughs> uh, Christian, how are you, John? Never, never been. Sorry. Not <laughs> stoned. <laughs> Not, not a very good Christian, apparently, or I would have been stoned at least, you know, ten times by now. I'd like to make a comment on that. Yeah, go ahead. Verse bring, bring us back to sanity, Mike. It says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. So some people might think, well, I don't have a lot of afflictions, so I must not be righteous. It's true. It's just like your friend said, I didn't have any, I broke my bones, so I must not be righteous. Some well, people don't have a lot of afflictions, and well, some people do, so... You know, I don't and, think that proves whether you're righteous. No, it doesn't. Uh, your soul is uh, is not in your afflictions, uh, and and. Uh, I think in the context, though, he's talking about your spirit. You have a broken spirit. Yeah. I don't know what he's really talking about. Well, afflictions. I think he's talking about afflictions that way. I don't think it's necessarily like having broken bones. Or uh, it, it, what, in my opinion of what he's saying there is that Saul's not going to get me. Yeah. Dave, David is talking about, see, see, we have, we have theologians who want to go back and read these things and read all kinds of stuff into them. But what David, what, the state of mind that David was in at the time was he was, he was running for his life from Brother Saul. And and basically he was he was saying here, I'm I'm trusting in God that none of my bones are gonna be broken. Now, it does, it's not worded that way. It down here down here at the end of the uh, Hebrew alphabet, that that, that particular letter didn't uh, that he couldn't start it out very well and say that. I'm guessing. I'm just I'm just so they take that verse and then make a whole book out of it. Yeah, out of they, do. they do. They do. And 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 what they forget is, uh, or maybe they don't even know, the stuff that I've led you through this morning in First Samuel, to give you the background on uh, the circumstances of David writing this. He's he he's in. In distress, he can't. He can't go home because uh, Saul will find him over there, and so he goes off over here to Gath, seeking some refuge. 
Now later we know, we learn that, that, that David uh, somehow amassed a, a group of 600 friends. They were all bandits, they were all outlaws, they were all no good nicks. But they were in David's, and when I say all, I'm not, you know, that's an overgeneralization probably. But, uh, but they, were, they were bad dudes. Uh, but David amassed an army of 600 people while he was out running from Saul. And, and in this particular case, he was alone, apparently. He ran over here to Gath seeking refuge and, and, and was aghast when they recognized who he was. And that then made him afraid. And so he changed his behavior is what this little thing he says, this little paragraph says. And in changing his behavior, he just started acting crazy, goofy letting spit run down in his beard and just making marks on walls, graffiti all over the place. Anyway, uh, that's the spirit in which, uh, in, in my opinion, the context of this, uh, knowing all of that background, he's not talking about Jesus hanging on the cross and not having a bone broken. Sometimes there is double meaning so on some well, of the there may be, but Jesus said to look into the Psalms and most of those Psalms, you know, for things about him. Maybe not this case, but I'm saying some of them there is. Yeah. Because the, they direct us back there. The, 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 here's the thing. Here's the, here's the thing. When when a guy is as close to God as David was growing up and being able to kill a bear and a lion and slay a giant and, and being put uh, in charge of the country. Uh, when he was as close to God and he wrote all this stuff, he's, he's going to write stuff about God that turns out to be true. When you can look back on it and say, yeah, he, he knew what he was writing. He was writing something that was going to happen in the future. See, I, 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 I'm not of that school of thought. I, I, I don't, I don't quite get it Peter, that way. You know, he quotes some of these verses. Yeah, First Peter. I, uh, so he's using them too he, as, to, as a thing for uh, today or uh, for his time. Uh, uh, and he's using those verses as applying them. Well, he, to, to he, everyone. They apply to everyone. He, yeah, he's saying, look, here's a good example of a guy who was close to God. Well, he's quoting verses. Uh, yeah. yeah, and right, and, and, and right, uh, this guy who was close to God wrote these verses, and they applied not only in Peter's time 2,000 years ago, but they applied today in Spring, Texas. We're running out of time. Verse 21. Evil shall slay the wicked. Boy, I don't want to be wicked. I'm going to get slain. And they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. I don't want to hate the righteous. I want to be the righteous. And that kind of applies directly to Saul. Especially the evil spirit. God sent the evil spirit on him. Take him out, right? Yep. Verse 22. The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. I just got through saying, I don't want to be desolate. All I have to do is trust in him. It won't be desolate. Now, hey, through, uh, through all of the things that I've uh, been through health-wise in the last uh, 60 days, there have been some really, really, really tough times. 
just just hard. Uh, but in spite of that, just this morning, Dorothy and I were counting our blessings. So many are the afflictions of the righteous, but he delivered them from them all. Now, uh, a lot of that, I think, is, well, uh, now I'm switching horses in the middle of the stream here because the context of, of David writing these 22 verses was he was, he was over here in Gath and, and feared for his life. He was over here in Judah and feared for his life. And he was writing this in that context. But now I want to apply it spiritually. That the, that, that, that the life of a Christian is not easy. Many are the afflictions. Whether they be uh, health-wise, bodily afflictions, or whether they be mental or emotional or... Uh, or applied by uh, co-workers or associates or uh, you, you call them friends but they're not really friends uh, we saw a news item uh, yesterday I think it was uh, and I don't remember this exactly but there was and I don't remember what state it was in but there was a picture of faith taken off of Facebook of two women with their heads kind of leaning over to, together with big smiles on their faces. And, and one of them just got killed for, I mean, just got arrested for killing the other one. And so I said to Dorothy, you know, it's, sometimes it's, it's hard to know who your friends are. You know? Uh, yeah. Greed has a lot to do with that sort of thing. Jealousy has a lot to do with that sort of thing. Uh, and, and, uh, and Saul was guilty of both of those and more. And he didn't want to give up his kingship. Now, there are several funny parts or ironic parts about that because Saul, if you know the story, he resisted being king when he was called to be king, when he was selected to be king. He said, oh, no, no, oh, no, I don't want to be king. Uh, but, but once he was king, he, he kind of liked that. And uh, he didn't want to give it up. Uh, and <clears throat> just briefly, the story, uh, of, of why, why he fell out of favor with God was that, 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 that Saul got too big for his britches, so to speak. That he, he took on um, uh, the duties of a priest when he was not supposed to be the priest. He was just supposed to be the king. God didn't authorize him to be the priest. And, uh, and God was upset with that and uh, what, he, what he did was he went out and fought a battle and God told him ahead of time kill them all kill all their animals don't keep anything that's there don't take any uh, any uh, booty don't, don't get their stuff burn it all destroy it all well Saul went off and he won the battle alright but he kept all their animals and, and he kept a bunch of their stuff and then he wanted to offer a sacrifice to God for winning the fight and, and he couldn't get God to accept the sacrifice. He called for a priest to come and, and do the sacrifice and the priest didn't, wouldn't come. The priest didn't show up because God was obviously controlling the priest and saying, no, 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 that's not what I want. And so Saul just decided, that, well, okay, well, if a priest won't come, I'll just be the priest. I'll, I'll, I'll be the guy, and we'll sacrifice the an animal. And, and when he did that, then God's spirit came to him.
and say, and say to him, what is this us? What is this us smell? Smelling the smoke of incense uh, uh, from, from the sacrifice. Uh, anyway, one of the most famous quotes of, out of scripture comes from this particular portion of the story where uh, Saul is telling him that I'm sacrificing to you uh, the best of the animals from, and, and I'm uh, 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 not trying to be detailed and accurate here in my story, uh, just paraphrasing, uh, but, but God said to, to Saul, do you not know that obedience is better than sacrifice? How many times have you heard that in Christendom? I mean, after all the time, obedience is better than sacrifice. Well, Saul was disobedient, and then he offered a sacrifice. And God said, you can't be king anymore. But there wasn't a smooth transition. In other words, old Saul didn't accept the results of the election. <laughs> Any other thoughts or comments? Or? Yeah, I'm going to talk about the last two verses a little. All right. The, the desolate. I think most people know what desolate means, but in this context, desolate means of no use. Like a desert would be desolate. Yeah. So in this context, it would mean that something of no use. Um, so they that hate righteous shall be desolate. Let's say that's the Lord redeemeth my soul. Redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him, trust in him shall be desolate. This is a, I, I just love talking about Revelation. I'm sorry, but the abomination of desolation. Yeah. The abomination that makes desolate. Once again, we're talking about Jerusalem. That's what Jesus is talking about in all the discourse. He's going to destroy the temple and make it desolate for all time. He destroys it, not for a little while, forever. Yeah. And see, now people are talking about rebuilding the temple and all these well, that's things. Man. That's, that's, not, that's, that's man, that's not God. That's man. Abom that's not, abomination that yeah. makes desolate means it is destroyed, it is of no use anymore. Yep, but the, but the, man the, the can temple go, is now inside us. Man can come back and build the temple in, in a disobedient sort of way, just like Saul was disobedient in offering that sacrifice. But it wouldn't be a temple of God. Of God. It would not be a temple of God. See, that's but, the but man, people but, think that this is man, actually going to happen. In the, uh, but, man, but man would call it the temple of God. You could call it that, but it wouldn't be. You could call it anything, but it wouldn't be, because that's the same point, that, you know, like, that um, if the, they're giving sacrifices, they put that as they're going to be giving sacrifices unto God, it's rejected well, by God, it's not a real it, sacrifice, it could, it's not to God. And, and maybe his spirit will say, don't you know that Obedience is better than sacrifice. Maybe I'm, I'm just throwing yeah. that out. I'm just saying that it, it's, it can't be for saving souls, and that's what a lot of people believe that this is. Listen, saving there's souls. there's a lot of stuff out there that a lot of people believe that is a lie. That's uh, the predominant belief. God, uh, in his in his words, said, "People shall believe a lie and be damned." Yes, ma'am. I just want to go back to the evil part. Um, God sees the whole picture and everything. Yeah. And he can use evil, and he has many times in the Bible used the evil and allowed it to happen so that he would it, it could happen the way he wanted it to happen. Yeah. And prime example is the cross. Yeah. I mean, the cross is a prime example. He allowed yeah. evil to... There's a story of Jesus, and it, and it actually killed Satan. Satan thought he was winning by putting Jesus on the cross. God accomplished 
Yeah. He used evil. Even in the New Testament, what happened? You look at Job, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Job is another prime example of uh, a lot of Satan to do those things to Job. But God is good, like our lesson says. He is good. But there's a time that he uses evil to bring back the good. Yeah. Just want to say that? He, he, well, Saul, the evil, he won all these people to come out of all of them. Yeah. That's pretty evil if you think about that. Yep. That's, not, that's not the best thing for somebody to do. What's that? Killing all these people. Oh, he means killing all the different people. Yeah. 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 Yeah, a lot of people struggle with that too. So you can think that is that's wonderful. And Joshua even more so. Joshua mm -hmm. did he he actually did what God told him to and he eradicated him. <laughs> Joshua. Yeah. When he told him. Anything else? <laughs> then let's pray. Lord, we are indeed glad that you are good we're glad that you are love we thank you for your goodness to us and for your love toward us we thank you for coming here for sending your son who is equal with you and for him dying on the cross for us dying for our sin redeeming us Thank you, Lord, for keeping us from being desolate. The righteous come to his house and learn. We also come to his house and worship. And we're going to do that today. And we're going to do it in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who indeed is our God. Amen. Amen. God bless you for being in his house today.